Hello everyone uh, and welcome to the 8th ALNAP um, Urban Humanitarian Webinar. Uh, we're delighted how many people um, are attending, so I need to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we have attendees from around the globe already, over a hundred of you are signed in and more to come. We thought it might be interesting just for everyone to know uh, who was participating, so um, a little bit less than half, about 40% um, of of you are total beginners in the in the subject of mapping, uh, or mapping in urban response at least. Uh, almost half, forty-seven percent, have some experience but not much. Um, Eleven percent, lots of experience in mapping but new to the urban area. Um, and then we have three percent of the real fundies uh, who are highly experienced in urban response mapping. Uh, it's a nice diverse group. Uh, we'll try and ensure that there is some something for everybody here, both of you, those who are new to the topic and for those of you who have significant experience in this, uh, and that we will continue this conversation in the community of practice afterwards, and we invite, would invite everybody who has questions to put them there if we don't get them to them, to them today, and would also invite those of you who really know your way around the subject uh, to participate and perhaps answer some of those questions as well. So, why are we why are we looking at, at mapping for this webinar? Um, well, we, we, well, actually, Gabby will be answering this question in some depth in a minute. But uh, some some thoughts from our side, as as many of you will know, the issue of information management has been central to a lot of the work that we've been doing at ALNAP recently. A lot of the work on evidence and how evidence is collected and the degree to which evidence is used and the work, the forthcoming work which we'll be bringing out next week on leadership and how decisions are made by operational leaders in the field. And also, those of you who've been following the webinar series will know that the issue of information generation and management has come up quite often in these webinars, um, the, which is perhaps unsurprising because the, the density and diversity and dynamic ever-changing nature of cities makes information management, particularly the analysis of information, the very large quantities of different kinds of information all changing, uh, and the dissemination and display of these, these levels of information, very difficult. And so what we wanted to do today was to give the floor to colleagues who've been working on a set of tools which solve for, go some way of solving these problems, uh, and which as a result are becoming increasingly popular and relevant. Uh, the, as, as, as more of us work in urban environments. And these are tools based around geographical information and around mapping. We wanted to give you a couple of examples which we can all learn from where mapping has actually helped humanitarians to understand what's going on in cities um, and also to look at some of the challenges involved in doing the, the mapping. And finally, uh, we wanted to reach out to the mapping community. So for those of you who, who have not been hugely involved in humanitarian response, a very special welcome to you uh, because we wanted to reach out to the mapping community and explain our work a little bit as humanitarians in the hope that we will all be able to work uh, more closely and more often together in the future. So, the first of our presenters um, I'll introduce now, uh, Gabrielle Arman, Gabby, is a fellow at World Vision International, currently serving as humanitarian GIS specialist in World Vision's humanitarian and emergency affairs department. Uh, in the department, Gabrielle supports the Disaster Management 2020 initiative, researching how to incorporate emerging technology, including your geographic information systems, into the department's global response operations. Before working with World Vision, Gabby was providing GIS support uh, and developing core emergency plans for local government, so has a hinterland outside the international humanitarian system. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted, Gabby, that you're, you're able to present and also would like to, to thank you for getting up so early because uh, you're in California. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is, as Paul mentioned, thank you so much again for the introduction. I'm Gabrielle and I'll be presenting on behalf of World Vision's Humanitarian and Emergency Affairs Department today. And what uh, I'll be walking through, uh, how can we use GIS, how can we use mapping to understand what those changes are and get better insight into what we're doing. So first let me introduce you to World Vision. We're a child-focused organization. We work in about 100 different countries and our humanitarian and emergency affairs department supports local communities throughout the globe 
in all phases of the disaster management cycle. Seeing that the world is going through rapid change and so is disaster response, disaster response today is not what it's going to look like in the next five years and beyond. Our leadership has launched a strategic initiative called Disaster Management 2020 to examine what those forecasted changes are. And two of those areas are urban response, given the rapid urbanization that the world is going through right now, and also digital and enabling technologies like GIS. What kinds of new technologies and tools can we use to do our jobs even better? So what I'll be showing today uh, in the rest of the slides actually comes from that research. So what is the urban population, what is the urban world expected to look like in the coming years? So two core reports um, that I'll be highlighting today um, are, uh, one is a report from the United Nations Population Division, and one is from the, National, uh, the U.S. National Intelligence Council. Those reports uh, provide about four key predictions and also uh, provide advice for three regions that we really need to keep our eye on. So for the first main point, one is that the global middle class is going to grow so large that for the first time in the world's history, most of the people living in the world will not be poor. And in fact, um, ex the extreme poverty rate is expected to decline by about 50%. We're going to see a rise in the number of megacities that the world has. So these are cities that have a population of about 10 million people or more. And what's really interesting is that the growth of these uh, megacities is actually going to happen in Asia and Africa. And it has a, a couple of inter interesting consequences that I'll get into in a little bit. With the economic activity that's going to be happening, we're going to see uh, the rural population migrate towards these urban areas. And in fact, the migration rate is going to be so large that it's going to exceed international migration rates. Just as urban areas are going to grow, unfortunately, so are the slums surrounding these cities. Um, and unfortunately, uh, many cities are not going to have um, the resources to provide the, the public service that is needed to uh, properly serve all of the people living in the surrounding area. And without external help, a, a lot of countries, in fact, are going to be experiencing food and water shortages. So looking at three areas or three regions that the humanitarian industry really wants to pay attention to, the first is the Middle East. The Middle East is one of the few areas that's going to continue to have a youthful age structure, meaning uh, a lot of the population, most of the population is going to be young. What does that mean? That means that, unfortunately, it's expected that um, the Middle East will continue to have interstate conflict and political instability for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Countries in particular that we want to pay attention to in that area are uh, Yemen, Iraq, West Bank and Gaza, Afghanistan, and parts of Pakistan. Looking to Africa, because of the continent's dependence on uh, agricultural production, um, this area is going to be uh, very much prone and at risk of some serious food security issues. And this is predominantly due to one big reason, and that's climate change. Um, precipitation rates are going to uh, continue to fall, and that's going to have a really large impact on agriculture production. Now, there are some technologies and some new methods that are being developed to help address these issues, but we'll need to see what sticks and keep an eye on what can be implemented, implemented on a wide scale. Looking next to South Asia, this region is expected to have not only more frequent uh, natural disasters, but also more severe. And that is also due um, to one of two reasons. Uh, primarily, uh, the, the first reason is that climate change is affecting weather patterns. We can see that in pretty much any country uh, that you live in, that I live in, is affecting um, what kind of weather events that we have. 
unfortunately for South Asia, most of the area is either touching water or um, countries are surrounded by water. So this is going to have a really severe impact on uh, the weather events that, that impact that area. So we can expect to um, respond much, much more frequently to this area. So let's take a step back into the present time and look at what urban life looks like today. And for the first time um, in our history, uh, since the mid-2000s, more people actually live in urban areas than rural. The number of megacities has tripled since the 1990s. But again, looking forward and into the next 5, 10, 15 years, the growth, the additional megacities that will be added will be primarily in Asia and Africa. The largest group of the urban population that's growing is uh, large cities, so those that have about 5 to 10 million people. But today, about half of the urban population live in settlements, quote-unquote settlements. So those are um, cities or, or areas with about 500,000 people or less. So how can we use mapping to understand uh, what changes are, are taking place? There are three areas that we can use GIS, that we can use mapping to get a better understanding of what's happening and also what we're doing in these areas. Uh, the first um, area is urban population tracking, so actually seeing these changes over time. There are maps that are being produced now um, that we can see on the web. We can see these forecasted changes and predicted changes in these different areas. And those would be good to get familiar with now. Um, and look at where we have our programs to see if we perhaps might want to change where these uh, programs are located in the future. Also, we can integrate statistical analysis with GIS. And what that can do is we can get forecasts of not only population changes, but also weather changes. Um, and we can also map vulnerabilities, what communities, what urban areas are prone to different kinds of weather events, different kinds of hazards, different kinds of public health issues. It's really great for that. For organizations or people that use Esri technology, um, which is one of the leading GIS software providers, something to be aware of is that they're integrating more and more statistical uh, and analytical tools into their software that are really easy to use. So you don't need a, a statistics background or an extensive statistics background. But they're starting to integrate that more and more so you can produce those yourself. For those that use Google technology, something that's um, interesting that use Google Maps is Google's crisis response team is actually adding a component to Google Earth where they're putting in these uh, vulnerability and forecast into their software so it's uh, already ready for you to use. I'm not sure when that's going to go live but it's something to keep an eye on. Also we can use GIS for monitoring and evaluation. So that means seeing uh, how well we're doing um, and where we're located. Tracking our impact over time and how you can do that is pinpointing where you're located uh, in a particular area and you overlay that on top of statistics or demographics of the population that you're serving. Um, you map the indicators that you're using to see how well they're doing and you can monitor that over time to, to actually visualize and get a really easy understanding of the impact you're making in an urban area. The third way that you can use GIS is site selection, so actually determining where you want to locate your projects or response areas in the first place. One way you can do that is with IDPs. Uh, remembering that urban areas are going to have some really serious infrastructure pro uh, issues. You might want to uh, assist with some kind of infrastructure projects. And then also placing community resources. And site selection is actually quite a simple thing to do. All you really need is to determine what factors you want to determine where you want to be. So let's say an area over a certain population or an area that's um, this percentage uh, prone to an earthquake. And it'll pop up areas on a map for, for you to be located. All right, so how do you get started? Let's say you're interested in jumping into the GIS pool. 
there are um, a couple key questions that you want to ask yourself first. One is, what information do we already have? If, that, if the information that you already hold um, in your organization has some kind of geographic component or you know what a city or what area that information is tied to, you can get that uh, mapped right away. Also something that you want to ask yourself is, what do we want to see? And you can compare those two answers to determine where's your gap. What kind of information do we need to reach out or search for so we can make sure that we're answering some of the key questions that decision makers have in our organization? If you don't have GIS staff already or technically skilled staff um, at this current time, uh, what uh, I recommend is that you reach out to volunteer and technical communities like GIS Core like Humanity Road. And what these are, these are organizations of professionals who have 15, 20 years of experience who want to provide their support pro bono to uh, response um, organizations that are responding to emergencies. So that's something that you may want to look into. Um, third is look into what GIS resources are around you. There's a lot of uh, college and university programs that are emerging and they're full of people that want to support humanitarian organizations and volunteer their services. So you may want to look into those academic programs and perhaps bring on a volunteer um, or intern to assist in building up your GIS capacity. If you already have a GIS program or want to grow it a little bit more. Something to think of is let's go beyond mapping. Let's start to integrate maps with other forms of data visualization. So what does this look like? It means including maps with bar charts, with graphs, and configuring it in a way where it's really easy for decision makers to get a quick overview of what's happening on the ground, developing instantaneous situational awareness. One way that you can do that is by creating a, a dashboard, an operations dashboard, which I'll show in a minute. And also when we look at urban environments, uh, some of these areas will be in conflict and be prone to um, experiencing issues with connectivity. So you want to be sure, especially for those areas, that your GIS program, your GIS system can handle working in unconnected or disconnected environments for periods of time. And there are applications, there are softwares that can do that for you. So what I want to do is I want to show you an example of a dashboard that we, we created here at World Vision for one of our response uh, efforts. So for uh, Typhoon Haiyan, what we did is we grabbed uh, the information that we were gathering on the ground and we plotted it on a map. So what you're looking at is a formula, formula that our information manager actually created. And the darker the red, the, the more um, assistance was needed in that area. The more uh, green areas were the areas that didn't need uh, immediate assistance right away. And on top of that, you see these little uh, green flags. These were areas that we had planned to do distributions at the very beginning of the response. And the great thing about mapping these two pieces of information together is that we were able to verify that in fact where we were doing distributions is where it was most needed. Looking to the left, here are two of the four widgets that we had. One is having a gauge, understanding how far we were in meeting our goal. Our original goal was to, to reach out to about 140,000 people. Um, our team actually ended up reaching over 700,000 people. But right now what you're looking at is a snapshot very, very early in the response. Looking down a little bit, we could see how many kits were uh, distributed um, in each city. Um, and if we scroll through the wood widgets a little bit more, we could see uh, what kinds of kits were dist distributed for each city. This project went so well that we're actually piloting a, a regional monitoring dashboard for East Africa. And even beyond that, we're developing a GIS system for our recovery work in the Philippines and also a dashboard for our Syria response team. So that will have um, uh, the disconnected environment component. So what are some, some more recommendations looking forward? One is 
uh, humanitarian organizations are really going to want to develop close relationships with local government. There are a lot of open data initiatives uh, coming online, like the Humanitarian Data Exchange, a couple of um, other websites where we can grab information much more quickly to map what's happening in urban areas. But really, local governments are going to have the information that you need to get the best insight into their population. As cities continue to develop, they're going to be integrating IT into their infrastructure. And so what does this mean in short? It means that they're going to be able to gather real-time data on a lot of what's happening um, in their city. And populations are going to be uh, uh, interacting um, with this information much, much more. So that means they're going to have some real-time monitoring of what's happening on the ground. And you're going to want to capture that, some of that information. You're not, you, you may not get that unless you have a relationship with them. Cities are con going to continue to open up a lot of their data, uh, have websites where you can grab a lot of the information about uh, their population. But again, you want to have that relationship. And you want to be able to go back to them, perform some analysis, and show them some things that they may not have known about those that are living in, in their areas. A recommendation is to explore using the power of crowdsourcing to gather information on the ground. Some platforms to look into are the popular Ushahidi, uh, crowdcrafting.com. Um, the humanitarian open street map is a really great example of using crowdsourcing to do damage assessments after emergencies. And so you have you know, thousands of volunteers looking at satellite imagery and showing where uh, damage has uh, uh, proliferated in an area. And that in information is distributed to any kind of uh, humanitarian organization that wants it. Uh, a forecasted trend that we, that we see happening is that organizations are actually going to create their own internal volunteer groups. So going back a little bit, capitalizing on GIS professionals that maybe, let's say, in academic programs or may not be affiliated with the community yet, those will be corralled by humanitarian organizations to assist in, in uh, building up their GIS capacity rapidly after an emergency. Something that uh, is interesting and in, you may want to explore how the U.S. Uh, Department of State is doing this, but they're helping to corral these quote-unquote digital humanitarians. And uh, with a program called MapGive, it's actually creating much more uh, skilled volunteer force when emergency happens. Open street map. So now I'm going to give it back to the organizer. And what I want to direct you to is to our blog. A lot of the information that uh, was provided in this presentation will be uh, on our blog and available for you to, to utilize. And I'll cite some of the sources that, um, that we're using. But if you have any questions, of course, I'm here to answer them um, both during the webinar and afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gabby. Absolutely fascinating. I think we'll take quite a few questions on, on those ideas. Um, and just to underline, I think there will be interest in uh, some of the links that you suggested or some of the other organizations and resources, the, the tech volunteers uh, corralled or not, and also some of the websites with open data which humanitarian groups can access. So if you could include those in the blog, that would be fabulous. We'll also, of course, try and put those uh, some of those into the community of practice so people can access them there. So before we come to um, to, to questions and, and uh, discussion around some of the points you raised there, Gabby, um, I'd like to introduce our second presenter for today, um, Matt Wenzel. Um, Matt is currently the Regional GIS Manager for the Middle East and North Africa with the REACH initiative based in Geneva. Matt's worked with REACH in South Sudan, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey and the Philippines. He's an urban planner by trade and he specializes in physical planning and geographic information systems. He's a strong advocate for further integrating the urban planning profession within the humanitarian sphere which is something that we have often talked about in, in these webinars. I'd like to just say a little bit about REACH. Um, I think uh, uh, Matt will, will introduce um, the organization, but it might not be familiar to everyone. Um, it's a joint initiative of two, uh, two NGOs, ACTED and Impact Initiatives, and UNISAT. 
um, and it, it, it works on an issue which is very dear to ALNAP's heart, um, developing information tools to enhance the capacity of aid actors to make evidence-based decisions. So this is another way of trying to, trying to improve the quality of decision-making uh, in the chaos of, of what's often the chaos of early phase response and beyond. So um, we're delighted that Matt's with us today. Um, he's going to speak particularly about uh, the use of mapping in the Syria regional response. Uh, and beyond that, I think over to you, Matt. Thank you, Paul. As Paul introduced, I will talk about three separate contexts, um, highlighting the challenges of mapping in Syria, providing an overview of our host community mapping experience in Jordan, and finishing with a review of our informal infrastructure mapping efforts in Zatari refugee camp. Uh, as Paul mentioned, um, REACH is a joint initiative of two NGOs, ACTED based in Paris and IMPACT based in Geneva, also partnering with the UN Operational Sat Satellite Applications Program, UNISAT. REACH's global team is based in Geneva and comprises specialists in data collection, management and analysis, GIS and remote sensing. We have regional offices covering the Middle East and North Africa, as well as East and Sub-Saharan Africa and West and Central Africa, as well as numer numerous uh, short-term deployments as emergencies arise. In the first section, I'd like to highlight the challenges of mapping in Syria. In northern Syria in particular, REACH has been working on remotely managed assessments and remote analysis since early 2013. Our experience in Aleppo has included urban multi-sector assessments and shelter damage assessments. Limited access and an ever-changing situation due to ongoing conflict present a constant challenge to gathering detailed and accurate information from reliable sources. Mapping has been used extensively as a means to get the most out of the data that is collected in these difficult areas. For Aleppo City, for instance, there are recognized neighborhood boundaries which allow for the attribution of data to small subdivisions of the city, ideal for demographic mapping. However, it's difficult to obtain data that can be precisely aggregated to the neighborhood level. Enumerators managed remotely are often reliant upon cursory observations in the field and a limited number of key informants. Therefore, participatory mapping exercises are used quite frequently, resulting in overlay maps. And due to limitations on primary data collection, remote analysis and secondary data review are also relied upon heavily. In the map, you can see the Aleppo neighborhoods. While not official, they are generally recognized and would allow for great urban demographic mapping. However, the crisis is such that much of the data collected simply do not align. This assessed area map highlights the issue of access and also shows the certain types of data that don't fit neatly within recognized boundaries. We go through participatory mapping exercises in which we identify areas of control that are often changing, as well as populated areas that are assessed. An example of data that does align to neighborhood boundaries, these monthly urban displacement updates indicate the wider trend within the city uh, with origin neighborhoods and destination neighborhoods. Unfortunately, we're forced to remain skeptical about the figures that come out of Aleppo. While we receive information about which neighborhoods urban residents are fleeing to, the numbers simply aren't reliable, so we're stuck with broad figures of the overall displaced population in the city. Here's an example of remote analysis. We've worked with UNISAT on satellite imagery analysis to detect changes between before and after images to identify damaged structures. While this is very detailed and effective with certain types of damage, it is impossible to capture the full extent of damage on the ground and must be paired with direct observation or ground truthing. For instance, lateral building damage is very difficult to spot from above if the tops of the buildings are still intact. However, given the constraints in Aleppo, field observations are often too generalized. Here you can see a map that highlights both physically assessed areas and UNISAT damage data. There's a clear divide between the two, and the result is an imperfect product with widely varying resolution. But we can utilize both efforts to direct subsequent efforts. Severely damaged areas highlighted by one method can help target the next attempt using the opposite method. So the challenges of mapping in Syria are really the challenges associated with data collection. And the key challenges are the insecure environment that constantly poses a threat to the health and safety of staff, irregular access to areas of the city or population groups, which make continued trend analysis difficult. Uh, remote management of staff is a particular challenge and it causes uncertainty due to um, irregular breaks in communication, and the resulting often low levels of reliability and or inadequate focus of the data collected. One of the key questions that came in prior to the webinar 
was asking for advice for mapping in areas with high insecurity. So these are the five critical things that I would recommend. Building a team that you trust, it's critical to vet and train a network of enumerators and key informants that you can rely on. And you can't overstate the importance of field coordinators and network coordinators that you really do trust. Don't take unnecessary risks. Let staff on the ground make the call regarding their, regarding their personal safety. Local staff do know the situation best. So it's best not to pressure people if they're telling you not to, that they can access a certain area. Devise a flexible sampling methodology based on access. You need to be realistic about what you can collect and be flexible enough to adapt to a changing situation on the ground. And once you have collected the data, you need to be honest about the reliability of the data that's collected, being transparent about any limitation, and consider reliability scoring. This is something that we've used um, in multiple multi-sector assessments in which the reliability of different thematic data sets isn't the same. So when you have a series of maps between health, wash, etc., it's really key to highlight that the reliability of that data varies throughout the, the set of maps that you're putting together. And last but not least is to triangulate. It's really important to cross-reference with remote analysis and secondary data review and pursue mixed methods approaches when, when possible. So moving on to the next section, at a completely different context, I'd like to talk about our host community mapping experience in Jordan. We conducted a large-scale assessment of refugees living in host communities in the northern five governments. At that time, there were a host of problems. Information management systems were struggling to keep pace with a rapidly changing environment. There was no overview of settlement patterns. There was a complete lack of reliable data on populations and needs. Aid delivery was chaotic, and the situation was changing rapidly as it became clear that it would be a protracted displacement. We devised a three-phase approach, which would allow us to increase the resolution over time. In the first phase, we went through a participatory mapping exercise in which we met with community members to identify community-perceived boundaries. These were hand-drawn on reference maps and later digitized, and this was paired with key informant interviews that we then attributed to the BSU boundaries. We referred to them as basic service units, which is kind of a benign term. And Get that gave us a high-level picture of the situation that would also inform later steps in the process. In the second phase, we conducted a detailed household-level assessment in each of the BSUs covering demographic data, accommodation status, registration status, protection concerns, displacement profile, and needs or access to basic services. This effectively amounted to a census of Syrian refugees living in host communities as we visited all known refugees living in those community, according to our key informants. The third phase included more detailed sector-specific assessments and updates to phase one and two data sets. Data from all phases was shared with other actors, along with a contact list of community leaders and vulnerable populations directly feeding into programming and targeting efforts. Here are a few examples of the composite BSU maps for northern Jordan. In this map, you can see the distribution of the Syrian refugee population in host communities in northern Jordan. Here you can see the predominant needs, and this helps to influence targeting of relevant distributions across the five northern governments. Water and sanitation needs help to prioritize WASH programming across all five governments as well. And unvaccinated children, this helped to prioritize areas for measles vac vaccination campaigns as well. Through this methodology, REACH was able to provide an overview of the refugee settlement pattern in host communities in northern Jordan. We were able to identify and locate vulnerable populations in relation to available services and provide reliable data on the needs of the population to other actors supporting the design and coordination of sector-specific programming. The BSU methodology was particularly useful in the urban setting. As urban neighborhood boundaries were largely absent in northern Jordan, the BSUs allowed for the urban population to be subdivided for analysis, revealing trends within the urban areas. Urban and rural data were also directly comparable, allowing for further stratification in the analysis. And in terms of protection, the BSUs allowed for sensitive household level information to be aggregated to a more meaningful community level without jeopardizing the safety and security of refugee families. It's important to note that individual household locations, there were well over 20,000, were not mapped publicly due to protection concerns expressed by partners. However, location information was shared with relevant actors for programming and targeting purposes. Moving on to the final context. Zaatari Refugee Camp, and to give a quick introduction, in late 2012, uh, Syrian refugees first started arriving in the camp. 
and less than a year later, the population is over 120,000 individuals. This made it the third or fourth largest city in Jordan. Dynamics quickly became apparent that necessitated which is tailored to an urban context. And today, there are numerous similarities with urban and formal settlements elsewhere. Over time, residents in the camp started reorganizing themselves unofficially into household compounds, relocating tents and caravans of family members around a central courtyard. Continued dissatisfaction with the wash services provided that were collective wash centers, toilets, shower facilities, etc., led to the proliferation of informal infrastructure, improvised toilets and showers, and their related drainage systems, septic tanks, ditches, and pits, all at the household level. It's important to note that none of this was authorized or regulated, so it was unmanaged and it created a very significant sanitation problem in the camp. At the request of UNICEF, REACH conducted a detailed household wastewater assessment. Here are some photos that highlight the challenges. For the methodology, we started with a participatory mapping exercise in which we map with camp residents to physically draw household boundaries over satellite image overlays. These were then later digitized back in the office. Uh, we took GPS locations of wastewater storage and drainage locations, and we conducted a short household wastewater survey using ODK on mobile devices. Here's a composite example. Uh, this shows the polygons digitized for each household, as well as points and lines for the actual wastewater infrastructure. And here's a more detailed view of District 2, one of the most densely populated parts of the camp and most problematic. And it's interesting to note that uh, there are several households with well over two or three wastewater storage areas. And this is an example of District 5, a far less dense portion of the camp and less problematic as a consequence. So through this methodology, REACH was able to gain a detailed understanding of two important informal phenomena in the camp, the formation of household compounds and the establishment of informal infrastructure across the camp. Camp managers and WASH actors can now utilize these products and data as a baseline for programming and the eventual formalization of the camp-wide camp, camp -wide wastewater system. One of the next steps for the camp is to establish a, a formal land management system. The success of the wastewater effort has led to the evaluation of a similar methodology to formalize household parcels that would form a cadaster and subsequent database with associated shelter IDs, registration information, and demographic data which could help pave the way for some form of land tenure for residents in the future if the crisis is protracted for several more years. And this methodology can also be particularly useful in other types of dense and formal settlements, but I should note that in this case, the availability of, of high-resolution satellite imagery, as well as the access to the community and the cooperation of residents were critical to the success. So if access were a challenge in another settlement, it would be quite challenging to to implement the same methodology. And that sums up my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of this, or feel free to send me an email and we can continue this, this discussion. Matt, thank you so much. Um, so we have two very informative um, presentations uh, to kick off with. We have had some questions that some of you put in advance of the today's webinar, and we'll start with some of those. One question that we had, uh, and often, which often comes up in, in, in discussions of any sort of urban humanitarian response, is the urban-rural question. How, how different is this, really? And I see that we have quite a lot of, uh, of, of experience of what's in an urban situation, uh, in a rural situation. And so, Gabby, I wondered if we could start start with you and ask a question that was, was put in by, by one participant. How does, or does, and if so, how does mapping in urban areas differ from mapping in rural areas? Um, and what, if you are a mapper, do you have to particularly, what is new or do you have to particularly bear in mind when you're thinking about mapping in, in urban areas, and particularly in very densely populated cities and megacities? My answer to this would be the technique of mapping um, or your technical skill is still the same, but the difference is going to come in data availability. So where in more rural areas, you'd probably need to develop GIS data yourself. In urban areas, you're much more likely to have that information already online somewhere, so it'll save you some time. Something to think about, though, is you really want to 
um, with those available data sources, you want to understand how often that information um, is updated, when it was last updated, and maybe even what methodology was used to, to, to develop that information. You want to do some data integrity uh, evaluation. So that would be the, the primary difference uh, in my experience. Thanks, Gabby. Um, and I think that, that does bring up some issues that we've heard before about the, the importance in urban settings, in all settings, but particularly in urban settings, of looking for the data that already exists. Uh, and some of it links to, to some of the, the interesting issues that, that, Matt, you were raising about data quality and that some, of the, some of the work that you've done in, in Aleppo to look at and evaluate the quality of the data. Matt, I'm, I wondered if we could move to you with another question that had been put in, which I think slightly relates to um, to the last one. Gabby was, was talking about the availability of uh, information in urban environments. Um, is that also true? Have you found this is true in informal settings and in slums? And more broadly, what mapping tools would you recommend as being effective, tools and approaches as being effective for mapping informal settlements? We rely on participatory mapping a great deal. Um, it's a great way to understand community perceptions as well as structures and dynamics. And as you pointed out, a lot of the data doesn't really exist publicly, so it has to be created. And the greater the access to and the participation of the community, the higher the success you'll have in creating those data sets. Um, that said, I think high resolution imagery really helps a great deal with viewing complex informal patterns from above. And um, a newly developing technology that's probably going to be in wider use in the humanitarian sector is the use of UAVs or drones. And these offer a unique perspective that's not too high above that can really give you highly detailed images of informal infrastructure um, from not too great of a distance in height and at a pretty affordable cost. So I really do think the proliferation of these will increase over, over the next few years. Thanks, Matt. That's, that's very interesting. In fact, um, you'd mentioned already the, the, the issue of participatory mapping. Um, and I wondered if I could just sort of jump to ask, drilling down a little bit more with you on that, asking if you could tell us a little bit, walk us through a little bit more some of the approaches that you've used to participatory mapping. Um, maybe any tools, kind of off-the-shelf tools that you would recommend to, to participants today to sort of be looking up for participatory work. Um, and also, sure, sure. if I may, sorry, and I'm, 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 I'm heaping a whole load of stuff on this one, but also the sustainability of this kind of participatory mapping work, mm -hmm. the, the degree to which if you have any experience of how, whether communities are able to take this over for themselves. So three things there, really, the, the kind of process, any tools that you'd recommend, and sustainability questions. In terms of process, we really do do it the old-fashioned way. So we, pre we print hard copy reference maps and we have focus group discussions and we get consensus viewing a reference map and then we physically draw the boundaries. And these are digitized later and we use ArcGIS, which is the off-the-shelf conventional GIS platform that Gabby had talked about. Um, and we use that more than anything. Um, however, there are open source applications that I think um, are more accessible in the sense that they're that they're free. However, I would caution that there is a bit of a steep learning curve in jumping into using QGIS or some of the open source GIS applications. Um, we found that they're they're actually much more difficult to get a handle on, and they're not as smooth. And there's a lot more glitches in terms of reliability going forward. Um, in terms of the sustainability of these participatory mapping efforts. Um, it's a really good question. We have yet to have uh, a handed over sort of sort of product. Um, I think the closest we've come is we've recognized community leaders sort of so associated with some of these um, boundaries drawn through the participatory process, and they become a re reliable um, community update mechanism effectively. So they're not taking the lead. In, in managing the process, but they're taking the lead in conveying the information to the community um, and the, the aid community at large. 
I think that would be ultimately the goal is to, to hand over a, a platform that could be managed in the community. And I think there, there should be some applications in the future that can do this. Um, some of the online applications, RJS Online or, some, or, or Google, for instance, could be good platforms for this. But again, there, it's, the, it's that, that sort of technical wall that has to be broken through in the community. It's definitely not impossible, but it, it's been a bit of a hurdle to this point. I can understand that, and I, I would um, ask all of everyone taking part here, if anyone has examples, good examples of practice in any of these areas, if anyone has got more experience or, or experience coming from a different kind of, uh, kind of perspective around this or any of the other questions that we're asking our expert presenters today, do please share it in the community of practice. Um, Gabby, maybe we could go back to you. One of, one of our, our questions that came in uh, before today was, um, the way that your experience of how can mapping be used to identify and locate vulnerable populations and put them in relation to available services. So sort of the, the uses of mapping in terms of identifying who needs support on, on the one hand and the support that's available on the other. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience there? It's a simple process, but it might take some time to actually create that information. So you, if you have that information already available, um, data on, on uh, populations, what you can do is you can easily plot that on a map and um, also pinpoint um, or place on a map where your projects are located or maybe where additional projects, um, another organization's projects are located or you can map um, what kind of infrastructure an urban area has. And by um, having that information on top of each other, those, those layers um, overlaid on one another, you can easily visualize if resources are too far away from the communities that, that need them most. Uh, the main thing, though, is to uh, seek out that information if you, if you aren't creating it internally first. Great, thank you. Um, you just mentioned something there, and I'm going to just jump straight to it, the 3W or the, the 4W. Um, the, the, the degree to which you've seen um, mapping used or, or visualization used as a, an effective way of sort of demonstrating 3W, 4W data, um, and the sort of benefits that it's had for, for programming folk. Maybe, could you tell us a little about that? Sure. Well, something that's really interesting is that volunteer and technical communities, which I referenced or touched on a little bit in the presentation, they actually do this a lot for humanitarian organizations. And I was able to see the process that they went through. So what they do is they create a spreadsheet, and uh, they log where organizations are located, um, what kind of work they're doing, and they have a row for each city or each area in an urban area that uh, uh, organizations are responding to. And when you have that information in the spreadsheet, it's actually quite simple, a very simple process to, to plot on a map. A lot of GIS software that is out there now is becoming a lot more um, friendly for those that aren't uh, advanced in, in terms of GIS, so you can simply just drag an Excel document to a map and it'll plot it for you. Um, you can have, you can use print maps, but what's this? I think is especially helpful is if you can drag that information and put it in an online map, so that way you can click on a point or click on an area on a map, and that data will pop up for you um, in a table that's really easy for you to see and, and visualize. It's not many years ago when perhaps one of the most effective tools in, in, in sort of early response planning was a great big map on the wall and a couple of, couple of sheets of polythene over the top that you, you wrote on top of. It's, you know, it's incredible in this area of so many to see how far the sector has advanced in, in a short time. Um, both of you have, have, have spoken, though, about you know, the danger of the recognition that the map is not the territory and, and the, the importance of recognizing data quality um, that's going into the visualization. Um, if it's being used for, for decision making, these maps um, can, I suppose, to a degree almost be misleading if, the, if we don't have the right information on them. And yet, as we all know, in particularly in rapid onset emergencies, 
getting good information can be can be quite difficult. So I wondered, um, Gabby, if you could you could give us your thoughts on this. You know, tricks or approaches that you've used to balance the sort of quick and dirty getting products which are useful for decision makers quickly on the one hand with ensuring reliability and credibility of the data on the other. How, how have you gone about doing this? Sure. Well, I think when you have uh, much more time where the projects aren't urgently needed right away, so maybe preparedness projects, forecasting, or um, recovery projects, you can really take your time in understanding what information is out there, what information you're using, and particularly what methodology um, was used to, to create that information. However, in a, in a response when um, data is needed right away, when you're grabbing what's available out there, uh, one thing to do is try to build relationships with uh, potential data sources beforehand and understand how they collect information. If you, aren't collect, if you aren't creating it yourself, understand what methodology they use. So that way when an emergency happens and you're tapping into, let's say, a volunteer technical community or another kind of data source, you, you, you have some confidence in, in what you're showing. Um, also, when you're uh, developing these products, let's say in a response when that information is needed right away, I would recommend that um, you have an asterisk or, or you make sure to note to the person you're handing your GIS map to or your dashboard to that this is the information that we're using right now. Just be aware that you know it, it may not be 100% legit at this moment, but this is what we have right now, and so just take take what I'm presenting you with a grain of salt. It's, it's uh, a lot of times better to have something that you have uh, a good level of confidence in than, than no information at all. But developing those relationships beforehand, not just with governments, but let's say with other organizations that create GIS data or agencies um, or volunteer and technical communities that create this information for us to use, understand, build those relationships first and understand how they, how they create that, that data in a response environment. Uh, thank you very much, Gabby. I, I wonder, Matt, do you have anything to add to that? This was a topic that came up in your presentation, particularly um, in the challenging situation in Aleppo. Yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I think I might end up saying the same thing in a slightly different way. At first, I would say that quick doesn't necessarily have to mean dirty. Um, you can still devise a rigorous methodology to collect a statistically significant sample with a high level of confidence for a rapid assessment. If, tomorrow even. The key is to design a realistic methodology based on the constraints and be transparent about any limitations. And ideally a rapid assessment would be followed by a more in-depth effort from you or a coordinating agency later. I'd say that lack of access is the only real threat to reliability. This is, this is the factor that we can't really control for. Um, and in terms of credibility, I think if you're clear about the, and transparent about the methodology for the data collection, you'll maintain the credibility um, as, a, as an information uh, collecting organization. Thank you. Um, and I would uh, um, also, on this question of, of uh, quality, cred reliability, credibility of, of information and of data, um, direct anyone who's interested to uh, ALNAP's report, um, Insufficient Evidence, in which we lay out six criteria, which, uh, which the ALNAP network, or members of the ALNAP network, believe make for good enough information um, and good enough evidence and those can perhaps be useful if, if, any, if for any of you who are sort of thinking through some of the challenges of, you know, am I, am I satisfied, am I confident? Talking about networks, um, I wonder, Gabby, one, another question that came up and a very pertinent one is whether there is uh, a, uh, a, a, anywhere which someone who's done a little bit of mapping or is entering the mapping field uh, from the humanitarian area could find, you know, a sort of a single single portal or resource where they can find um, tools and resources, and whether there are any communities of practice or user forums, uh, GIS user forums specifically for NGOs and humanitarian organisations. Yes, yes. So two. Um Two groups that I would recommend looking into are, one is Interactions uh, GIS Working Group. Uh, sign up with that and they'll keep you updated on um, interesting webinars and, and resources that are, that are available. 
Um, also, one uh, group that I find um, that provides a lot of value is uh, it's called the Worldwide Human Geography Data Working Group, so WWHGD. Uh, and um, about every month or so, they provide just really great presentations on, on what organizations are doing in, uh, as far as GIS and response go. Um, for those that aren't specialists in, and are new to the GIS world and, and want to understand more of how that works, I would really recommend signing up with uh, Humanitarian OpenStreetMap or OpenStreetMap itself and go through the tutorial that they have. It's really easy to follow. Go through the tutorial that they have that will show you how to uh, use their map, adding information, digitizing information, outlining uh, buildings. Um, and that will start to get your feet wet and you'll be able to understand more of, of um, how GIS is used and, and how specialists develop the maps that you use. Um, also, I would um, put in some research and I'll uh, be sure to uh, highlight these some on, on the blog that goes up later this week. But look into what open data portals are out there. Um, the Humanitarian Data Exchange just went live. So that'll be a really key place to, to grab the information that you want to map. Also, there are some other ones out there. The Department of State's uh, Humanitarian Information Unit reaching out to, let's say, UNISAT. Um, and also just networking uh, with the, uh, organizations in these working groups and asking um, other professionals how they map their information and how they're building up their GIS strategy and GIS capacity as well. Great, thank you. It's uh, it's it's one of the things about the humanitarian sector. For for those of you who are joining us today, who who are not from the humanitarian sector, for, who are from the mapping community, um, that many people say the humanitarian sector, uh, if it was being designed today, we probably wouldn't make it this way. It's very highly atomized, and there's a lot of different stuff going on in in different organisations and those organizations or those initiatives are not always very well connected. So it's really good to hear uh, about these, these opportunities for people, experts from different organizations to, to come together and to share their knowledge. Thank you for that, Gabby. Matt, a question for you. Um, some questions have come in um, from uh, participants today. Um, some of them looking perhaps at the, if, if, if one might say, the dark side of mapping or the potential downsides of mapping. Um, and, and one of these, I'm sure, will have occurred to, to many of us thinking about mapping in uh, conflict areas. Um, and, and it's this, and I'm sure it's one that you've, you've spent much time thinking about. Uh, how do you address the issue of data sharing with governments and, I suppose, with, with, with other uh, non-government actors in contexts such as Syria? What, 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 have you, what has your learning been around that, Matt? Wow, that's that's a really good question. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, some of the the data related to the Syria crisis is is borderline in terms of humanitarian application and what what starts to seem like intelligence gathering, and that's mm. that's kind of a boundary that we flirt with, and we know that if it's starting to cross the line, then it's a map that we just simply don't make. Um, However, even a lot of the maps we make, a lot of the data we collect, there's a lot of sensitive information in terms of um, family identification, location of refugees in Jordan, and the data protection is taken very seriously. However, the, the real challenge that we've faced is being able to, to quickly share data with other actors so they can use it quickly for targeting and programming. Um, the, we're still working on agreements at the country level and at the Geneva level to have streamlined data sharing processes formalized. But in the past, it's been done on an individual level with particular donors or UN agency. Um, and the process is somewhat different. And there, are, there tend to be um, bottlenecks in the process that create significant delays. Um, in the case of the host community mapping project, for instance, where there were several frustrating delays in releasing some of the information to the aid community in Jordan, um, which I think in, in from a humanitarian point of view is inexcusable, but however, the organizations weren't uh, really prepared to deal with the, the perceptions of the Jordanian government, for instance. Um, this was effectively a census 
in Jordan and the results didn't match specifically with information that was collected by the Jordanian government. So in this case it was not received well and led to discussions between UN agencies and the government and sort of put a hold on the process. So it took us several months to work that out before we could continue with other host community activities after that, in fact. So it's, it's something that I don't have a clear answer for yet other than it's something we're working on and we're trying to st streamline the process at the beginning of contractual agreements so we have a clear avenue for data sharing as we get to the end of the data collection and pr production of maps and other products. Obviously, it's one of those, it's going to be case by case, I'd imagine, and it would be very interesting to hear uh, from, from other um, participants uh, after, after this in the, in the COP, um, the experience they've had in their own context. But I guess, I guess the, important, the important thing is not so much the answer, but the question, and as much as, as recognizing how, uh, how important these issues of sensitivity around data and the use of data by um, by government or by armed actors can be. Uh, and so I'd thank, uh, very much thank whoever asked, asked that question and you, Matt. We'll come back to the, the question, uh, the, the issue of bottlenecks that you brought up in a second. Um, but first of all, again, uh, looking at some of the, the potential negative effects or, or effects that need to be guarded against of mapping, Gabby, um, another question that we've had, um, very interesting idea that mapping here can make the mapped areas more more visible than those that remain unmapped. Um, by mapping somewhere, it becomes more salient, more visible to humanitarians. What does visibility always lead to more aid? And if so, do you have any concerns that areas which are unmapped and so forth less visible uh, will be underserved by in humanitarian responses? Uh, I wouldn't say I haven't found that to be the case. Um, uh, thinking about the high on response and the mapping that we did there, if there wasn't uh, a, uh, data immediately available, then the primary focus was getting getting that information for, you know, quote unquote, invisible areas. Um, I don't think, in my experience and in, in my understanding, that just because the area doesn't have um, much information available yet that it would necessarily mean that resources wouldn't go to that particular area. I think um, when resource allocation or GIS is used for resource allocation, you make those assessments when you have that information available for the entire area that you're surveying. Um, that's when that assessment is done. I wouldn't necessarily uh, foresee that happening or, or think that would happen much. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I guess it's one of those things again that one has to that one has to bear in mind when one's in in the business of of uh, producing and visualizing information. Um, and as as you suggested, take certain sort of steps, uh, not producing things until all the information is in. For example, take certain kinds of steps before to 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 mitigate any downside here. Um, Matt, you talked a minute ago about one very significant bottleneck, and and one of one of our our participants, um, coming from a sort of program management perspective, I, I would imagine, um, asked if you could sort of highlight the key bottlenecks that might occur in a in the process of of uh, mapping and using mapping for for data visualization analysis and dissemination. I think this is a really great question. Um, often we 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 sort of don't know how difficult things are going to be until we're halfway into them. And if you've got any sort of fail-safe workarounds or things that people need to consider before they become engaged, it would be very useful if you could share those. I think uh, the number one bottleneck relates to uh, data handling and data format. Um, often we have enumerators in the field, um, assessment managers, who are collecting the data, they're managing the information, and then there's this sort of data dump to the mapping team. Um, and the, the number one key piece of advice I think I can give here is to have the GIS mapping specialists outline what the proper database format should be and provide some kind of training to enumerators and assessment specialists 
that the, the data that they're collecting, they should be responsible for putting it in that format. Hmm. Um, this is maybe the single largest bottleneck that we've had is data coming in in various formats and then it falls on the GIS team to reformat that data and perhaps days of work going to it and it could have been completely avoided in the beginning. Thank you. Um, so that's whoever put that question in, thank you very much and that's obviously the big one to avoid and, uh, and as Matt said earlier on also this issue of of being aware that sensitivities might might block the dissemination of data for some time as, as was the case in Jordan. Thinking about which um, and about how you know how, how important up-to-date information is in humanitarian response, another participant has asked Gabby if you feel that mapping makes sense in fast-changing urban environments. Uh, it's something that has been noted about, about the urban uh, environment is, is it is very dynamic and things change very quickly and and is that a problem for mapping do you think I would say it is very much worth the effort when you know that a rap you're dealing with a rapidly changing environment um, you want to think beforehand about the methodology that you'll go through to to keep your maps updated but it's so much easier to understand what's going on in the area when you have it on a map um, even if you have to say um, you know, or note on it that, you know, this map was created or it's a snapshot, you know, of last week's activity or last month's activity. It's much better to, to use a map to, to visualize what's happening than to try to read it in a report um, by itself uh, or, or somehow uh, try to understand what's happening in a spreadsheet. Uh, perhaps what you, can, what you can do to avoid any issues related to that is have your map, um, but supplement it with um, in talking or or with uh, a note, you know what changes have have occurred since then. But really, you want to think beforehand about um, how often you want to update uh, your maps and what resources you'll dedicate to making sure that those maps will stay as up to date as possible. But it's very much worth the effort to do so. It's just uh, the situational awareness is is much more improved when you can use GIS for that purpose. Thank you, Gabby. It's interesting to see how many of, of the issues that, uh, that we've all noted earlier in webinars and in, in other work around information are coming up here again. I'd just like to underline three of them for, for people who are in sort of more broader program areas um, that I've heard today. The, the first being in terms of thinking about any information that is going to be used for decision making in programs, um, thinking at the time before the information is collected about the, the, the measures of quality and how, how are you thinking about quality rather than trying to do this when a whole load of information has been collected and has, has come in. Secondly, um, thinking about in advance about how information is going to be categorized, ordered and analyzed. Uh, very often we've, we've, we've heard from, from our map members and, and colleagues how a lot of information, a lot of uh, person time goes into the collection, um, but it then leads to loads of information which can't necessarily be used or processed. So thinking in advance about uh, collation and analysis. And thirdly, Gabby, the point that you were just making, I think, very well, about the importance of thinking in advance about how information is going to be kept updated and fresh, um, rather than having thinking of information collection as a process, as our friends in ACAPS have put it, and not as a product. And these three things, particularly in urban environments, urban environments, but in all environments, humanitarian environments, seem to be issues that come up time and time again. Um, I'd like to go back, um, maybe for the last question of today, to one, I think, uh, which has come related to the, um, the participatory mapping question again. Um, and this is, uh, I'll ask you both, uh, whether you have any suggestions on resources to introduce maps and the idea of maps uh, to populations who've never used maps before. Um, have, do you have any, any particular ideas on this? One, one, uh, one listener who's, who's currently working in Haiti has faced this challenge and is eager to have any resources or, or ideas that you might have. That's a challenge. I mean. Um working in different contexts and humanitarian response, I think you run into uh, differing levels of, of map literacy, for instance. And um, it's not always what you would expect. I mean, I think it's fairly senior people, expats in the aid community as well. Um, 
are not very map literate. So there's a there there's a learning process I think that goes along with a lot of the the map dissemination that we do, um, and it's sort of a kind of a teaching how to read maps. Um, or as Gabby mentioned before, the the moving the map legibility a little bit better, and it's it's easier for people to absorb the information. So, I mean, I think I would I would advise more information product than rather um, static conventional maps. Do you have anything resources to help people um, to introduce maps to people or probably never used them before? I mean, for us, it's basically through through meetings with um, community members, with working groups, presentations. It, it's really a physical process that we go through. Um, so if it's if it's members in an informal settlement, for instance, it's it's physically um, sitting with a hard copy map on the ground, or sitting in a working group with a PowerPoint presentation and talking through the map. Um, it's something that we that we've never really gotten away from because it, we still find that it's it's quite necessary to to go through this and make people um, uh, make sure that people are understanding the map and the information products that we're putting forth. Great, thank you. And so in, in the end, there's no workaround for actually sitting down with people and working with them. I said that was the last question, but uh, there is one which points us to the future, which I'd like to ask Gabby. Uh, and this is the last question that we'll take today. Um, and that is, Gabby, uh, one, one participant asked, what do you think the future of GIS is in the humanitarian sector? Um, and, and do you think the data is going to be increasingly produced by volunteers and non-specialists? Do you see a kind of move of, of GIS and, and geographical data visualization from the specialist to the more general population? Absolutely. And in, and in fact, the leading GIS software providers that are out there are making the changes to their software now. So you don't need a master's degree. You don't need a certificate. Um, in GIS to be able to create good maps that, that you can use and can provide insight. Um, you'll likely still need, or, or you will definitely need in the future, people who understand data and can perform really complex analyses. But yes, um, I would say in the very near future, uh, software will continue to be configured so that non-quote-unquote specialists can, can use it just as well. Great, thank you very much, um, and and it will be, I think, a happy day when we when when the the software is easy to use as the older the old piece of polythene and and a magic marker, and that's hopefully where we're moving towards. I would like to thank you both, Matt and Gabby, for for really really thought provoking, excellent presentations, beautiful presentations as well. By the way, we really love the graphics, and um, and for for taking the time to think through um, questions. That both those that have been put beforehand and uh, those which were put during the, the course of today's webinar. So although we don't have a function to allow the almost 200 attendees um, to, to give a big round of applause, I think you can imagine a virtual massive round of applause. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you also to everyone, humanitarians and people from the, the mapping community who've joined us today. Uh, we'll be picking some of the questions Apologies that we weren't able to get to everything that people were asking. There were lots of great questions here we didn't have time for, um, but we will be taking these questions into the urban response community of practice, um, where we hope that you will all be able to uh, to, to share um, your experience and your answers to these questions. So not just Gabby and Matt, but you'll be able to give them a bit of a break, and some of our some of the expertise from the group will also be shared in there, as well as any new questions that you have. So we look forward to, to seeing that in the community of practice and to Gabby's blog. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you very much to our presenters and to the ALNAP team here who put the whole thing together, Leia in particular. Uh, and I wish you a good morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, as the situation suggests. Goodbye.